everyone, everyone. I'm Victoria Wiltshire and this is Song Trader Happy Hour. A big hello to our audience. Thanks for joining us once again. We have a very special guest with us today. And during the last 20 minutes, that's when you'll get a chance to ask him some questions. So don't forget to enter them in the Q&A window on Zoom or via chat on Facebook. So on to our guest who needs no introduction, but I'm going to do one anyway, of course. He has been consistently at the forefront of major global releases throughout the past few decades, either as director or producer, transitioning seamlessly between film and TV. In the world of film scores, collaborations include Hans Zimmer, Randy Edelman, Thomas Newman, Danny Elfman, Trevor Rabin and Harry Gregson Williams. Now back to filmmaking, he has the ability to create iconic moments moments that get in deep and skillfully take us on a journey. Here are a few of them. Many of us were there to cheer on the Jamaican bobsledding underdogs in sadly one of John Candy's final movies. We remembered the torture of unfulfilled love while Peter Gallagher was sleeping, when John Travolta swapped his 70s disco suit for a big fat IQ, he helped us believe in something greater than ourselves. Nicolas Cage led us on one of the world's biggest treasure hunts ever and then taught us that sorcery just needs the right pair of pointy shoes to work. And then, of course, we were introduced to the dentist's nightmare, affectionately known as the Merg. Okay, so the trivia part's over, and I'm sure you would have guessed all of those movies because these are legendary movie moments made by a legendary filmmaker, and actually, he just happens to be a pretty cool guy. I'm talking, of course, about the legendary John Turtletop. Hi, John. How are you going? First of all, legendary for dead people. Let's, <laughs> let's go back on that. Um, and, uh, yeah, you're overdue. I can name at least... 40 directors far more legendary than I am who are alive but it's still great to be here are you in Australia is that where you are no oh I'm in LA and I, mm. this is going to be a very interesting interview but you know like I didn't ask the 40 other directors I asked you and I'm True. very excited to have you here so I mean if that's okay I'm just going to keep calling you legendary love it you also it's interesting you left out Mark Shaman and Mark Mothersbaugh so why do you hate them? I don't. That was a test to make sure that you were going to bring them in. Both very talented, brilliant guys, both short. Okay, um, just like me. How many people are listening to this other than you? Right now it feels like it's you and a tech guy. <laughs> it's, um, well, I don't know. It's international. So, we, I mean, we have... We have a few people on our Zoom and we've probably got quite a few on our Facebook Live. So hello, everyone. And well, hey, if you, if you guys... There. Scott, LG, what's up? Okay, there you go. So say hello to John, everyone, like in the chat. Yeah, good. Thanks, 5,000. Um, this is great. <laughs> so, I am excited to do this. Do this. this is, uh, composers are a big effing deal. <laughs> What do you mean by if no, I won't go there? So can I can I ask you a question? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so if we start at the beginning of your process when you start work on a film, when do you actually start thinking about the music part? I'm not sure uh, in terms of other directors, and we should probably preface this whole thing for all the composers out there that every director is different, different insecurities, different goals, different styles, and as you know, different knowledge and experience with music itself. Um, they tend to just be themselves and you all can be yourselves or you have to adjust for each one and we all do that. Um, for me, there are movies where I've actually had songs in my head where I've been waiting to find a movie to put them in, knowing that they were great. I knew the opening title music to While You Were Sleeping about 10 years before I made that movie, knowing one day I'll do a romantic comedy and this would be the opening song, and it worked perfectly. And then someone told me it's too expensive, and then I call your dreams go away. Um, sounds like Hollywood. Um, so did it make it in or no? The song that oh, you yeah, it, 
uh, Natalie Cole, Everlasting Love. This will be an Everlasting Love. Um, the the tr the truth is, is, you know, sometimes you have a sound in mind or a feeling in mind or a, a score in mind, but you usually are so overwhelmed with other crap that it's very hard to think of it. What you're just doing is your own tone and trying to get it right on the set and have a thought. The truth is the person who has the most influence over the music in the movie is not the director or the composer, it's the editor. And the reason for that more so than ever before is that when the editor's putting stuff together and they send you a scene to look at while you're shooting or a bunch of stuff or an action sequence, they're going to put music on it. And you're going to get used to that music quickly. You may hate it and go, I oh, would you do. I hate that music. And then you go back, but they've had the first uh, swing. So you really need a great relationship with that editor. And your music editor needs a great relationship with that editor and with the director. Um, I'm sure we have some music editors on here uh, since that's such an important overpaid job. <laughs> um, it is, uh, it's really at that point that the music starts setting its tone. The bane of existence for composers is the temp score. They get handed something and say, can you do something like this? And it's usually either by a composer you hate or worse, it's by you. And you've done that already. You don't want to do that score again. And they've hired you because they want that exact same score again. And that's no fun. None of us like doing that. So, um, you know, it's hard in yourself to know the difference between your style and your exact music. Um, most people, I think, just have an ear for what seems right, and they write that, rather than go back to their tone and listen to their other songs or music and say, oh, let me write another one of those 12-bar songs that sound like every other one. Um, so... If you would get you know, to use the editor, uh, right? you, Say again? You would have a say in, in the editor, correct? Say with the editor, but that's that first thing that gets in your head and you're so insecure about what you've shot. Suddenly it comes to life. They put music on there and, and it's like, wow, this is pretty good. That's romantic. Uh, that's wrong, but the first part was good. Then as you're editing your movie, you with the editor are putting music on and creating a temporary score. What happens in the course of doing that, Victoria, is you fall in love with it. And that's partially because you're used to it, but also directors especially feel what they've created is this house of cards. Their movie's terrible. They've gotten it to a place where it really works and they don't want to wreck it. And then in comes a whole new creative voice at the end. And there's more to talk about in terms of that. It's a big deal. This whole new powerful creative voice that is crucial to a movie. And it enters late in the process when no one wants to wreck what's good. Or people are thinking, thank God the music's going to save it. Either way, the director's freaking out at that point. Music matters so much. So much. I feel like the top three things that matter in making a movie good are the script, the actors, and the music. Right? And we've all seen from making our little... Uh, MacBook, you know, movie, the collage of all of our photographs, it looks like a bunch of boring pictures. And then you hit the stock music thing and suddenly it all just comes to life. And it can be crappy music, but it feels real at that point, like a movie and it makes it bigger or smaller. Um, it's, it's no joke. Um, but getting it, getting good music is easy. Getting the right music is hard. And who determines whether the music is right? 
you know, first choice is, you know, the, the composer wouldn't have written it if, if they didn't think it was right. But then the director gets in and goes, no, this is what's right. I need this, this, this. Um, then, of course, the studio watches it and says, what the hell did you do? But they yell at the director, who then has to go yell at the composer, who yells at them for it being their idea and making them change. <laughs> um, and then ultimately, it's the audience. Um, yeah. So it, it's, it's all a very complicated process. Some directors show up and play music on the set and want the actors to hear this vibe and all that. Um, but for the most part, I just wait until the movie tells me what the music is. Mm. I love that. Well, we, we have a word. In I'm going to give really long answers just like this to save you, Victoria. <laughs> Does everyone out there know Victoria and or Paul? These are amazing yeah. people who are found a way to have a, make a living by helping people in this business and they're crucial and their stuff is great. So well done guys. Oh, um, John, I see now, I don't know what to say. I I'm so embarrassed. I mean, seriously, you're, you're awesome. And I mean, what you've done, your gift to the world is really amazing. We, we love your stories and, um, you know, you talk about being insecure and, you know, there's, there's shitty movies and all this kind of thing, but seriously, you've made some, some real moments that we'll remember, you know? Yeah, thank you, but they come out of all that insecurity and fear and panic and do it again, do it again and stick to your guns and or don't think anymore, let everyone else tell you what to do. They're probably smarter and just be quiet and let them do it. Um, and movies, you know, yeah, there's those ones that worked out great and I'm very aware you didn't mention the bad ones. Um, the composer. <laughs> there are no bad ones, <laughs> but uh, moving right along. Um, so, yeah, yeah, good timing. Um, it, so, in the music world, you talked about um, you know using temp tracks, and oh, I wonder who that handsome devil is. Um, yeah. It's impossible to get a question out with you, isn't it? Um, we call that demoitis. I don't know if that's something that you get in, or what you call yeah. that in the film world. Some composers like it. Some composers, all they want is you to tell them what they want and let them go write the music. A lot of act, I, I actually think composers and actors are very similar, which again, we can get into, but tell me what the F you want and watch me write music like that. Even with the temp score, they go, okay, I get it. You want this to be busy. You want this to be uh, in a, tense minor horror movie sort of vibe here and they don't get caught up in it others look i i don't know how a composer can handle it if you're an actor and i mean if i'm working with uh whatever anthony hopkins and i found my british friend earl to just act the scene out on video and then i hand it to anthony hopkins and say can you do it like earl uh, it would be crazy yeah. but that's what we do Composers. Right. So just on your communicating with composers. By the way, I'm interrupting, but by the way, we have to. Don't get mad at us. We have screenings of the movie before you guys even start. We have to have music on there. So it, it's, an, it, it's a necessity. And what's interesting is I have asked and brought up the idea, let the composer give you the temp track. They don't even have to write it say what I'm interested in, I think what you would like is this piece of a John Powell score, or this little piece of a, uh, a David Newman piece or, or um, uh, Desplas or whatever it is, and let them supply. Everyone goes, no, I don't want to, can't do that. The studio doesn't want to be paying them from December when their music's supposed to start really working in September. In addition, a lot of film composers go like this when another composer's playing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So it's tricky, but that's the perfect way to do it. If you ask me, you tell me what my temp score should be. Yeah, well, you're gonna have to start controlling the budgets and then you can control the timing as well, right? Um, but, uh, okay. Yeah, anyway. So um, what, what happens then? So let's say that you bring on your big composer and do you- Why is and ascending out 
uh, like, look at me, look at me stuff. Come on, Ty, it's my moment. What? Okay. That was on the bottom of the screen. Ty Hanna said, look at my great work. Oh. Only <laughs> All right, keep going. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm going to persist. I'm going to keep trying. So do you actually say, like, um, listen, Hans Zimmer, love your work, but I, uh, can you give me something different? Like, how do you, what's your approach when you're speaking to someone who's clearly has a lot under their belt? Well, Hans is the easiest because you end up talking to the young person in his studio who actually wrote it. So that's stressful. <laughs> um, and Hans, in a way, it's funny because Hans is very supportive and open to that stuff often because he didn't put the sweat in the first time. So it's not as visceral reaction when you say, ah, that's not right for me. Um, okay, talking, so one different then. No, maybe I tried um, the wrong example. Well, no, 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 they're all different. Other people, you know, most composers also have their assistant composers who secretly, without telling you, are writing cues. They don't have time to write them all anymore. Music has gotten so wall to wall. Um, you're writing 70 to 80 minutes of music for a 90 minute movie. Um, sometimes 92 minutes of music for a 90 minute movie. That's not doable in two or three months. And sometimes you don't get two or three months. I did a score for a movie in 17 days. Um, and when I say I, I mean Mark Shaman did. Uh, and it was brilliant and amazing. Now, was it detailed like we wanted no was it too loud and overdone yeah because we didn't have any time to finesse anything so there's problems um what was your original question <laughs> well i i think we're way beyond that I, I was actually really i just wanted to know like what's your approach when you're speaking to um a composer because obviously it's it's personal to them just like it is for you it is you know there's there's different First of all, you're going to show them the movie. You may talk about the music before even that. You're probably talking to them about the music before you hire them. Okay. And say, I'm looking for this kind of thing. And I don't know, I'm open to this and whatever. Some director's like, I want this. You've done that kind of thing. I want it to have a military sound to it, blah, blah, blah. And then they can decide. Um, you're usually out to composers and you hope one of the ones that you really like says yes um, and when you have that first meeting with the composer they're meeting you just as much as you're meeting them right they're deciding if they want to do your movie um, you know unless it's a younger newer composer so you're expressing not what you want in the music but what you want in the movie this movie is about this for me. This is what matters to me in this film. This is where my focus is. Those kinds of things. And I think composers like hearing that you have a vision, that you have an idea, that you have a sense of the tone and what matters to you. So there's priorities in the movie. Um, composers tend to say, oh, there's something unique I want to do here. I've never tried this. And, and you hope there's a match. Then they, you send them the movie and you decide whether it's with or without the temp score. And then you go talk about it. The first thing a composer should do is tell you how fucking great your movie was. Oh my God, I can't wait to get started. So good. And then give you specifics. I'm not kidding, right? If you go, yeah, you know, the music is going to help a lot. So... Yeah, well, Whether you're lying yeah or, that was one of my questions, you know? Don't be shy with the compliments. We're, it doesn't matter. Everybody is insecure and wants to be loved and appreciated. Um, it's a vulnerable thing. You know it. You, it's what you do for a living, too. You write this thing, and we all tend to love what we have created ourselves, right? We listen to it over and over. First of all, we're all really proud that we created anything, right? Out of the air that didn't have this piece of music in it, now it has this piece of music in it and it's because of you. It's an amazing achievement. 
And then you do all the stuff. It's not just the piano. Now you got strings you're putting on and you're done. You're like, look what I did. Um, if you're really experienced, you may not say it, but you still have that inside. Um, and when someone he hears your music, you're going, oh, please, oh, please, oh, please like it, please like it, please like it. Um, and it's the same thing with a director. You may think it's not, and you may need to act like it's not. And you may think it's, in, it's insulting to say to Steven Spielberg, this is really good. But I promise you, he doesn't want to hear anything other than that. Um, not that he's ever worked with another composer or editor. Um, <laughs> but I have a feeling even John Williams goes, Steven, you outdid yourself with this one. It's a great it. <laughs> That's just what John Williams sounds like. Um, uh, well, I don't know. I haven't heard him speak, but I'm sure it's a good impersonation. I just like it. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, in fact, I don't think I can overestimate how important that is. Yeah. Well, that makes the sense. The director's sensitivity you're aware of, but more so, be aware of your own sensitivity, your own ability to hear that criticism that is never not sure not never is rarely about the music it's about the kind of music usually an editor i mean a director has an issue with the moments it hits right for me anyway forget director I, my big thing always is does the music accent the important moments the changes it's not just let's get in the car rum rum and go right easy <laughs> that moment where the actor hears but i don't love you anymore and goes <laughs> no smug that's the moment right that turn that's what you want to express right yes there's all the nice and all that stuff too but the drama getting at getting hitting something and getting the fuck away from things all that talking right and let me tell you something as you know yes you're gonna have to write the big exciting music for the car chase and then they're gonna turn it all down and play the screeching brakes and the car engines revving really high. Or they're gonna play your music and the sound guy's gonna be furious because you're taking all the car horns and the brakes and the crashing down. But they can't really function together. Um, so leave yourself not just open, but easy. If you can be easy to deal with, when someone says, you know, I, it's great, it really is great. I just think maybe we can try to, right? They're all trying to be nice and respect the thing. And I think there's two reasons it's very hard as a composer to do that. Because one, you're very proud of what you did. You put your best foot forward. You thought this was not just the right thing and what the director wanted, but you also think it's good and it works. So feelings get hurt, right? Not in a big way, but you'll notice. Um, I hate him, but it's a shitload of work no longer do you just play a little phrase on the piano and if someone says, no, let's go somewhere else and go, well, what about this? You've put in so much time scoring this thing because you now can't stop, start, find a frame, hit a thing, sync it up. And then you fill out the score and you got basses and car horns that you've now treated to sound like tubas and all this crap. When they go, no, nah, throw that out, do a new thing, it's days. So you're pissed at the amount of work you have to redo. And that's another hard thing to swallow and stay supportive. Right? And picking your moments to say, I disagree. And I'll tell you why. You have a better scene here than you think. This is working. 
I need to not do you, I can do it for you and show it to you. But I would urge you to let it sit for a while. And almost every director will say, all right, that's fair. That's fair. And then they'll pretend to sit with it and make you change it. But <laughs> it helps. And it also gets you to show other people. Because I really like that. Okay, fine. That's good. You know, most directors want too much music, right? There are cases where you could use it that's not in a movie, but most people overdo it. I'm one of them. Um, and I work working very hard to not put it on. Um, okay, what else? How'd I do? The composer's learning? I, I just feel like I don't need to say a single word in this whole thing. I, I'll just take I, it away, JT. Um, thanks, Brad. Here's no, so actually what I wanted to ask you was uh, like all of these pearls of wisdom that, that you have, how much of that did you learn at film school? <laughs> you know, film school is such a bizarre thing. I went to USC. It's the best in the world. <laughs> what do you learn? You learn that you need, not how to, but you learn that you need to do what's right by other people's feelings and understand that they're not just an employee, they are looking at it as their film. That this is their creative contribution. Yes, they know they're serving this directorial master in some way, partially because they want to get hired again, but they also want to get hired again by that producer and that studio. And they want all of them to like it. And if the director hates it, but Warner Brothers loves it, eh, they're okay. Um, but in terms of the movie, yeah, they have a stake in it. So listening to all those people, as you do with an actor and an editor and a cinematographer, um, as the director and the cinematographer's doing with you. Um, I got to be, you know, uh, learn how a, a board works and what you can and can't do with EQs and, and volume and all that stuff. Um, by being in film school, there was a lot of that because I, I recorded the stuff myself and did, I actually had a musical as my main thing. So I was in the studio a lot. Um, but film school, this is not a big thing at film schools. Um, I don't know what the fuck they teach, but you, at best, you learn the things you don't previously know. And if you focus on the things you don't know, you learn more and you get bad grades. If you show everybody what you're good at, you get great grades, but you haven't learned anything. Um, so this it's kind of a life problem, too, in, in a way. And it's a career problem. You know, you keep showing people how great you are at that exact same thing. And that's the end of your career in th three movies. Um, Right. So, well, I don't know. Should composers go? You know, I think the best thing at film school for me, with the exception of composers, is as a director, you're learning what everyone else does. You're not learning a lot about directing, but you sure know what does a DP do? What does a sound guy do? What is the grip? What are the grips doing? What is the AD doing? And so now you understand their needs and their vocabulary. Um, and that has helped me a lot because I didn't know a lot of that going in. Um, so, you know, film school, it's, I don't know, you're better off for a composer. You're, you know, I don't think you need it by any means. Yeah. But for movies, you know, every, every student film you work on and see, the music, it, there's too much, it's too loud, it's too on the nose, um, and there's never enough instruments. Um, so you're trying to make the one violin sound like 80 and it just sounds like you're in an Italian restaurant and the guy has come up to your table. <laughs> um, so it, it's, you'll see. Yeah. Um, so was there one defining moment you would say that was a catalyst for launching your career? You know, launching is such a weird thing because you sort of fall into it. It sort of just kind of happens. And it, you know, even if you're an overnight success, you yourself know nothing was overnight. Um, 
you did a lot to get there and then miracles happen. Um, you know, I, I got jobs for crazy reasons, but, you know, and I was working at a time when I started where people were making movies that nobody had to see in order to make money. Crap. That would just go to VHS and, and fill the shelves at Blockbuster without anyone ever renting. Um, they play like in Thailand on Thailand cable at two morning. And that was, those purchases were enough to keep those producers making those movies. Um, but that gave me a chance to make movies that no one saw. So it didn't matter how bad they were. I just got to learn, um, which is a huge gain. When I finally did, uh, when I did three ninjas, it was a real small budget disaster, just a mess. Um, but, and not good in my opinion, when it, sort of was done but well what do you mean it's a mess what, what happened the mess, that, a mess none of money none of the producers spoke english um they were all korean and they spoke a little english um we had a chinese martial arts crew who not only didn't speak english they also didn't speak korean so it was really ridiculous and funny almost and complicated um they don't have the same sense of humor. So what I found funny, they didn't find funny and all that stuff. Actually, what I find funny, most people don't find funny. So <laughs> that, um, the, but that came out and not came out, but that had a screening and one executive from Disney was forced to go there by a cousin who called him and he was friends. And he saw it and went, holy shit, this is perfect. We have nothing in August. Shove this thing out there. And it, it did well. And if you're between the ages of like 35 and 45, it's your favorite movie ever. Um, anyone else, it's terrible. <laughs> that got me cool runnings. And, and then I was... Uh, you know, that did really well. And then you're like one of the, you're a person at that point. Not a big person, but you're a person. Yeah, yeah. And so does that mean that you are, um, to be a director, you have to be prepared to be uncomfortable, correct? Because you're filming in snow, you're filming in water. Like yeah, well, that's another reason why being a composer is awesome you're in a studio which is yours. They used to be just really crappy, moth-eaten foam, horrible studios, right? Now you can have your nice spot in your house. All you need is your laptop or three of them and your keyboard and you can do what John Williams was doing in 1982. Um, so, and you're always in a clean, comfortable place. And the most you have to do is send an MP4 and have the director come to you. Um, so that makes it a good job. Um, you know, one of the catches too, which is always a tricky thing for composers, and it's a blessing we'd all like to have, but they take on too many projects and they overlap them sometimes. So they put them back to back. The minute you have scheduled a movie after the one you're working on, you now have unbearable stress on the one you're working on. And when someone says, can you redo this cue? Now you're stressed about doing it because you got to start the other thing. And you're not doing a good job on the first thing. Um, it's like I, I, one of the things that I learned, because I'm wise, whenever you're somewhere, don't plan anything for when you arrive. It ruins the whole day of travel. You are all day stressed about getting there on time. Just arrive and if something comes up, how nice. Otherwise, you're just gonna ruin the trip. It's the same thing with that. Um, but, but booking things back to back, is that because they wanna strike while the iron's hot kind of thing? Like you just don't know when the next project's gonna come or, you know. Victoria, let me help you out here. Let me just help you. Do you think there's a question askable that the answer isn't money? <laughs> you can ask a question about- I'm just gonna rip everything up now. <laughs> What's the best score you've ever heard? 
Let's see how much money did that movie make? <laughs> and you can think about that, but it, we all turn to money as a gauge for a lot of things. And if it's not you who gives a shit about money, it's someone else who gives a shit about money. The reason you only have four weeks instead of 12 weeks is money. Um, not because they want you to work faster, but you have to for the money. Um, and that can work both ways, right? You're going to get a job over Hans Zimmer because you're a lot cheaper. And they don't have the million five to spend. They have a the five. $70. And, <laughs> and there you go. And again, how do you get started? I mean, I'm sure most of you are working, but how do you get started when the way to get started is to show something you've already done and you can't do anything until you're hired to show, right? However, that's not the case anymore. You can take anything now and score it. You can make a movie out of stills on your MacBook movie thing, whatever that's called, when they give you an album and score that um, and show people the kinds of music, how you record, what looks good. And somebody's going to hear, no one's going to hear and go, hey, that's good. He's talented. Oh, I like it. She's got the, a good style. What they're listening for is, is there something in there that belongs in the movie they're making at that moment? And that's what's going to turn them on. Something like that. Getting an agent is a little different. That's, do I have good movie music? Hmm. So, um, can we talk about TV a little bit? So, I <laughs> is that a no? <laughs> oh, but, but composing for TV blows. Um, well, actually, no, I wanted to ask you about Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist because I, I watched, it, I watched yeah. the episodes that you directed and there's some big song and dance numbers in there. So, the, But here's the thing. That's singing songs and, and songs, and that is music producing and kind of recreating. That was Harvey Mason Jr. Do you know who his dad was? Harvey Mason Sr. <laughs> and okay. Actually, Harvey is one of the great, uh, I think he was, uh, yeah, jazz bass player. Um, huge, one of the best. And played a lot with George Benson, anyway. You don't need to know that. Love George Benson. Harvey put all those songs together and either updated them or didn't try to recreate it, how to adjust it for the key of that actor singing and all that stuff. I cannot tell you the name of the composer of the episode. Okay. I'm a guest director. I never spoke to them. The editor is pulling things from a library of cues. They're usually fine. You know, nothing has a theme song anymore, which is a shame, because that was 10 minutes of work that paid for 10 years. Um, but the episodic stuff, it's so fast. The turnover is so quick. You are going back to cues you've written, and then you're, you may futz with them a little bit, um, mess with them a little bit, for those who don't know enough about us Jews. Um, the, you better get to know Jews. If you're working in Hollywood, I, we control the whole thing and the <laughs> banks. Um, that's another one. That's another session. That's a different session? Yeah. Yeah. But so, no, what I wanted to ask was because people out there probably don't know that you play a mean piano, right? I've seen you on the keys and you're pretty cool. Um, how much of your music knowledge did you have to use, if at all, to direct a music scene? I use a lot because I have some. Other directors don't have it, so they don't use it. And they either get intimidated and say, I don't know what to do. Somebody else do this. Or they say, fuck the music. I know what works emotionally. I'm going to talk about what works emotionally. I'm going to have the actors do it. And I'm going to listen to them sing. If it sounds shitty, it sounds shitty. I don't want it. Um, you also, they're doing pre-records. And then you got to figure out, oh, do I want to record this live or the pre-record? And goes, the pre-record sounds better. And then you go, I don't want it to sound better. I want it to sound real. There's all these discussions you can have. Um, we even found ways to go from live to pre-record and all that. 
And someone goes, oh, geez, did you hear the live recording? She's flat for that, those two notes. And the answer is, she won't be. Because um, we can do that now, right? It used to just be digital instruments. Now you digitize voices and suddenly they're awesome. Uh, so a lot of that is just not to worry about. Someone will deal with that. It's a bigger deal, actually, honestly, with the choreographer. That's a, a, a vernacular, a vocabulary that almost no one has. Um, my music background, and believe me, I'm not a great in any way musician or composer or songwriter, but I've written songs and play keyboards, so I know what it is. Um, I got... It, it, I was on a movie and we're scoring, we're in the recording session, which is awesome for a director because if you have an orchestra, how often does anyone get to stand in the middle of 72 pieces and hear them play? And there, as you know, there's nothing like it, right? You talk about surround sound and oh, it's the best. Um, but I was in the booth and something's not working and I was looking at the score and I said, what if you tacit the celli and the winds in bars 74, 75, and 76? And half the room looked up like, what the fuck? And a few people looked at me with this, fuck you dickhead, don't tell us. Tacit, <laughs> R word. You're supposed to say, make it shush. Um, so there's a, a line between doing, being up in someone's business and being a partner. And you've got to feel that out as a director. Some composers want you to not know how the sausage is made. But I was like, I know the right word here. I want to cut to the chase. And I'm tired of acting humble and stupid so that you'll feel smart. Um, and like, it's totally your show. And at some point, some directors start with, I don't care if you feel stupid, this is the music I want. And some directors are so worried about hurting people's feelings, they never quite get it right. Um, it's a juggling act. Um, and it's the same thing for a director dealing with an actor, right? You hate what they're doing, but they have an Oscar. If you say, I don't like that, they're gonna feel you're an idiot they're not safe, you're fucking up the movie. So there's gotta be a way of, you can say there's the, a great way of inspiring and motivating people in a bad way. Um, the correct way is there's a good way of lying and a bad way of lying. Um, and you guys are doing the same thing, right? Your movie's great. Oh, it's so emotional, these actors are so good. I just have to, not, like it's nothing, it works without music. In fact, there shouldn't be music here because I don't want to bother writing something because it's terrible. Um, you're not going to say that. Yeah, like. but I actually like your movies. I really do. Well, um, great. I'm not, I'm not going to use the word tacit ever. Yes. Yeah, that was, that was the word that undid your career, yeah? Um, so what do you wish that someone had told you early on in your career or even later? In terms of music and composers? In terms of anything that would have helped you perhaps navigate a few challenges a little better or? Don't, uh, you're good. Well, honestly, it's funny. Uh, these are bad answers. Um, honestly, it's good. We want honestly. But this is just for me. One, you get a great creative atmosphere when you're nice. It doesn't necessarily make your movie better. And that is a really tough line to walk. But look, all of this stuff is always the same advice you get with, with dating and all that. Confidence. See someone with a lot of confidence not ego, not bragging, confidence, you'll follow them. Someone who is excellent at something, you'll follow them. 
we're all attracted to that. And as a composer, you watch footage that is really good. You're like, oh, I want to hitch my wagon to that, right? Um, the only time you want to be the hero savior is when they're throwing out someone else's score and bringing you in. That's when you're like, I can't lose. All I can possibly do is be the hero here, right? I also learned, this is, I'm just going to say it now. Um, I should have slept with more actresses. Um, one would have been nice. The, the, it would have helped my career to be with more famous people. It sounds ridiculous, but people respond to fame and you get famous based on who you're dating. I only wanted to keep my personal life out of the picture. So I, if I was interested in a famous person, I just let that go because I didn't want to be ever in a magazine or anything like that. Um, yeah, but your wife's hot. So, you know, if I was ever going to have a girl crush, it would be on your wife. You know why I was able, well, I was going to say I was able to get a, a hot wife because I didn't waste my reputation on horrible people. But I also learned from my wife that it's kind of sexy to know their guy used to date that famous sexy person. <laughs> um, I'm not saying that's women. I'm saying that's my wife. Um, the, yeah, that said, do not sleep with anyone you are working with. It is a disaster. Um, certainly for a director. You know, I always think of, which you guys are all too young for, I'm sure, but I have this Captain Kirk philosophy where Captain Kirk cared about the Enterprise more than anything else that ever happened. He was willing to die for that ship. And, he and did. that's your, well, and he did. That's your movie, is the Enterprise. And if you're going to mess around with someone on set, and I think falling in love in a way takes up all the creativity. It's the same part of your heart and brain. When you're in love, you're creative. When you break up with someone, you're creative. That emotional, that's why there's songs about falling in love and songs about breakups. That's when you're most ready to write and, and bring stuff out. Um, and so there's things you can do in that case, right? It's not good to even hire someone you're married to, unless that's your thing. I don't know how Victoria and Paul deal with things, but you're probably so unattracted to each other after all these years of marriage working. Um, Don't go there. So back to you. Um, Yes. Yeah. So we have to get to some questions soon, but, you know, I just wanted to ask you one last thing. Um, What advice do you have for budding musicians trying to break into the film industry? What, what should they um, never do with a film director, perhaps? If you're young and new, impress people with your youngness and newness, right? Most people doing the hiring aren't young and new, and that's what they need from you. Lean into your strengths, okay? Yes. You can do the old thing. We all went to music school, and when you we didn't all go to music school. You would hope you went to music school because that's where you get the education of what everyone else wrote. Okay, if you write a piece of music that's the exact same melody as Mozart, and you go, oh, I didn't realize that, then you're an idiot. And it's like, yeah, that's not cool and young and hip. That's just an idiot. Um, but if you're writing something fresh and new and interesting, that's great. Um, work comes from work. The more you work, the more you get other work. Uh, it could be in anything, right? Whatever you're writing music for, write it, right? The people who say yes do much better in life than the people who say no. Um, Yes, push yourself, but be excellent at something. What is it that you have that you're great at? And what you're not great at, take on someone who is going to fill those holes for you. A lot of great composers 
who cannot read music, okay? You better get someone who can write down what you just wrote correctly, right? Obviously, orchestrators do that stuff. Most, a lot of composers, they don't know the difference between a C instrument and an E flat instrument or a B flat, those kinds of things. So they just write the music out, right? They don't have to know that, but they better work with someone who does know that. Um, the best advice I ever got was someone who said, never try to get a job, make a job. Everyone is looking for someone else to make them look good and make them money. So be that person, convince someone, they'll be more successful with you and that you're needed. That could be your music. That might simply be you have a studio at your house. And that $250,000 movie, they don't have any money to rent something, but you come with the equipment already. So that's your ace in the hole, right? Doesn't matter how good a composer you are, you have a computer um, and the whole setup. And I'm not kidding, right? They can walk in, you're ready to go. Um, you got to make a living, but you'll get rich eventually. Don't try to look left and look right and say, what did she make? What did she make? I need to make that much. Who gives a shit? Do stuff you like that pays you and it'll lead you to where you got to go. Um, and the other thing I would say that sounds crazy or irrelevant, and I think this is true of all filmmakers and in terms of composers too, only listen to good music. If you listen to not such great music a lot, that becomes your standard in your head of what music is. Listen to music better than your music. Watch only good movies. Don't watch shitty movies. It's going to lead you the wrong way and not inspire you. I have a little five-year-old, she's sneaking in. If she comes in, this could be one of those YouTube viral videos at her yeah um, well i was waiting for one of the cats to walk past my screen but they're all asleep right now there's one right there yeah. so um that so i would suggest that uh aspire uh, and be great and don't be stubborn and be nice composers like directors and actors we think we're supposed to be that fake image of beethoven pulling his hair out and screaming you're ruining my art you guys know deep down it's 25% art and it's 75% craft, right? You know how that machine works. You're looking at the image. You run out of ideas. You're like, fuck it. I'm just going to repeat this bar and change the instruments. I need something interesting. I can't just do a key change. It's because you know all those things. And you know what? Sometimes good enough is really genuinely good enough. Um, and good enough is good because it's good enough, right? It's not yeah, good enough. It's good enough. Yeah. Okay. Good advice. Okay. Some questions from our audience. Yeah. Let me see. So from Facebook, Arani Sen wants to know, who is one composer from the past you would have loved to have worked with? <sighs> A few. I almost worked with Jerry Goldsmith once, and we sort of started, and then it all fell apart, and then he died. Um, that was disappointing. Um, Henry Mancini, because he found a way to make his music create a genre on screen of music, right? Minimal stuff, sort of a jazz pop thing, but we can listen to it now and go, oh, it's so corny. At the time, it wasn't corny at all. It was really hip. And if you listen to the score of the movie Charade, it's, there has never been a less is more thing. Literally, one note on a vibraphone Bum, is the score in the scene. <laughs> and it's awesome. Okay. So that's, that's another one. There's living people too. You know, 
when you say, who would I like to work with? It's a very different question than whose music did I like? Um, mm. Because I want to work with people who are nice to me. Um, more because that's the working with part. Whose music is great? Well, obviously every person named Newman um, going <laughs> back to generations. Where I get into trouble and, and I lie is I've never liked Bernard Herrmann. And I, I just find it like smashing me in the face and musically just loud and too much and announcing itself. And it is the most uncool thing to say. Um, yeah, the shower scene in Psycho is great. A lot of the rest of it isn't. Um, this would be now my son walking in the room. That's Jack. Hi. Okay. Hi, um, boys. Close that door again. Yeah, That's the funny. whole family's involved. I love it. Okay, um, okay, so should we move to the next question? Sure. Yeah, maybe we should. I can right. two hours. You have to cut me off. I, I have a lot to say and very little of it interesting. So. Yeah, no, no, it, I love it. I, you know. Um, so from Zoom, Eldridge Zandam. Hmm, sounds like a superhero. Um, how do we unknown composers get introduced in the big world of filmmakers and directors? Can we just send our work? John, will someone like you take time to listen to it? Um, we are likelier to listen to someone's music than we are to read a script. Okay. Both because a script takes hours to look at, they're almost always bad, and then you get sued someone's music is easy it's a couple cues but timing is everything you want to happen to have it plop down in front of the director which is now emails instead of cds the exact hour they're looking for temp cues right and you go oh, that's good you're far better off getting in front of um music editors who want to farm things out from their composer, um, assistance to composers, composers, agents, and more than anyone else, music supervisors, right? Directors, useless, writers, useless, actors, producers, studios, useless. Music people at a studio, okay. But they have a movie, they're gonna go through their Rolodex and pick one of the eight they like and that's, all they need to do. Um, and if they're gonna really like a new composer, it's because they saw their a movie that their music was in. Um, if you have great music on a shitty short, everyone's gonna hate everything. Um, you're, the stink of that movie is gonna be on you and everyone else. If you have just okay music on the greatest short ever, everyone's gonna think your music's awesome. So if you can, work on good projects, not things with good music, right? I think it's true for actors. Successful actors choose good scripts, not good parts. Um, if you're a good actor, it'll be a good part, right? And if you're a good composer, you'll write good music. If it's a good, right? And if it's, anyway, whatever, you get the point. Um, <laughs> no, that's great advice. No, truth is, we don't want to listen to your fucking music. It's like, okay, that sounds good. So does everything. It's in a vacuum. It's just music. Is there a picture on it? Okay. And within five seconds, we're watching the story and we've stopped listening to your music. And that's if you've done it right. So work comes from work. That's it. Music editors. Get all the people who can hire you to make their life easier. Right? Yeah. Next question. This is from Dylan Smith. Is there anything that you wish more composers and especially up and coming composers knew or did? This is going to maybe sound old fashioned to me, but this has come up over and over and over. Film composers today are particularly shitty at it. Every producer, especially if they're my age or older, will say the same words over and over again. Melody, melody, melody. 
composers keep writing moods. They keep writing maybe a phrase. What do you mean there's no melody? It goes, ha, 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 once. Write a melody. Give me an actual theme. Theme is not chord changes. Theme is my mother-in-law walking in the room right now. Mother-in-law. <laughs> Oh, COVID's great. COVID's great. I love COVID. Uh, it's uh, very, bu very busy. Uh, melody, everyone. It is every great famous piece of music you've ever heard is melody, right? It is very hard to... Um, it is what made James Horner's career so successful. He wrote themes. I could hum a James Horner theme. I love Alexander Duplass's music. I can't repeat it for you. I don't remember any of it specifically, but when I'm watching the movie, I go, oh, this is actually interesting. This is good. Uh, John Powell, right? Love it when I'm watching the movie, but I can't hum it for you. But those great scores that you can hum, because then, like when you're writing a symphony, you have your melody, and then you change it a little bit, and you go, wow. Instead, you get, you hear the oboe, that's this character's instrument. The flute, that's the dog. And I'm like, I'm not making fucking Peter and the Wolf. What is the melody for him? What is the melody for the duck, right? I wanna know that stuff, and I wanna know it and don't be afraid of repeating stuff. And don't be afraid of writing more and letting the director cut and paste some pieces. Fill it with interesting music. All right, I've said the word melody enough. Quiet, next question. Okay, uh, I think we've got time for a couple more. So, um, Edward Adzima, on a scale of one to 10, how important is the composer production mix to be used in the film? Hmm. Zero. It, wait, are you talking about what you hand me from your studio or what we go and record, you mix it and then hand it to me? Well, I assume it's the second or the first. Yeah, it matters a bit. There will be times when your mixer and or director are saying, Jesus, that mid-range music is stomping on the dialogue. I need to just hear the percussion or I need more percussion. Or, so it's nice to have the ability to change that mix, but no one's listening all that fucking carefully, guys. It's, that's nice music and we can change it if we need it, but time-wise, we wanna push play and have it be perfect. Fair enough. Um, all right, composers, just make it perfect. I'm going to give you the bad news and not going, oh, it's so great, it's glorious what you do. I don't know how you do it. <laughs> um, last question. Um, this is from Joel Lynn Longbow. What are no. you doing? No? First of all, all the longbows have been difficult for my entire career. So I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> Joe Lynn or Joel? Joel, jo Joel okay. well, Joel Lynn, jo J O E L E W N E. How would you say that, Joel Lynn? I, mean, I would have said Joel Lynn, but it's spelt with a double N, so I think it's Joel Lynn. Oh, so, okay, keep going. Longbow, okay. great. There have been amazing people and horrible people named Longbow over the years. Yeah, isn't that a beer? Uh, look how you go. The Australians go to beer and I go to the Civil War. <laughs> All right. Okay, right. Well, I am, um, yeah. What are you doing at the moment? Making Boring question. I'm talking to everybody else trying to keep my father in law from dying. Yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, are you, are you making any movies? No. I'm writing movies. I'm doing that kind of stuff, but nobody's making any movies. One more question. Jesus, Longbow. You okay. Yeah, no, come on, go easy. All right. So, no, I guess, well, what I would like to know what are you is doing? What's, what's your dream project? Is there, do you have one that you would like to do? You know, there's two, I have two dream projects. I want to do a big old fashioned, splashy Hollywood musical. 
with contemporary music. So it has contemporary excitement, recording and sound, but with a, the joy of an older movie, right? Um, the other thing is to do a movie where you do it all. I would love to make a movie with a crew of eight people go out in the bush in Africa, spend as much time as we need, shoot during the perfect light, get just the right music with as much time as we need, even try myself to write some music, edit it, you know, the, that one time you get to do it all. Um, the other dream is in results. Everybody wants the Oscar, the most successful film of all time, or the life changer. Um, I've gotten close in life changers with some people. It's never though the whole social landscape of the world changes. Um, but I've been quoted my movies a lot. And so that's good. Um, but the real dream project is the one that they're talking about 25 years later as a movie that mattered. Yeah. I think you've made a couple of those. And um, thank you to who, who corrected me. It's Strongbow Cider. They're saying, Paul Noon, <laughs> it's not Longbow for you. <laughs> so well, I, got that I believe Longbow is the real name of Sundance. Um, Sundance's real name might be Henry Longbow, or, uh, but I'm not sure. Somebody can jump in there. Uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance fame. Maybe it was Butch's name was Henry Longbow. Um, that's all I got for you. Um, well, so I think that's all we have time for. Um, Great. So <laughs> it's fun. I really like doing this. I, I really do because it pushes me to think. Um, and work hard, guys. Don't take it so fucking seriously when it comes down. It's also a job and personalities. It's not you in a room painting like you can. Do that on your own time. The rest of it, it's, it's a collaborative job. Well, on that note, I might actually hold you to that and get you to come and talk to us again with your family, of course. The mask. Yeah. Um, so, John, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, it is always By fun. By the way, you guys may not know this, but even though she's a terrible mother, her kids are freaking brilliant, genius, amazing kids. Um, Victoria's an amazing mom, also an incredible singer and keyboard player. Her husband, terrible bass player, but very good guitar. <laughs> He's probably listening. I'm sure. I'm sure you're going to get an yeah. email after this. <laughs> um, never a dull moment with John Turtle Talk. Uh, this is the guy. And so, you know, anyone who didn't jump on today, next time you're going to have to because it's so much fun, right? Um, thank yeah. you to all of our audience. We hope you found this really valuable and enjoyable. You'll be able to view the full session on YouTube tomorrow. Look out for the link in the webinar follow-up email or the post on our social channels. And also let us know in the comments what you would like us to talk about on Happy Hour in the future. Um, on our next session, we'll be discussing the ins and outs of powerhouse songwriting for placement. Look out for details. <laughs> Stay safe. <laughs> I should just get you on every single time, all right? With that, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Stay safe and be kind to each other. See you in two weeks for our next happy hour. See you, everyone. Bye. Take care.